Hello and welcome to Australia in Space TV. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media. Today we're joined by Ryan Hartman, President and CEO with Worldview. They are taking space flight to the stratosphere, uh, particularly for space tourism. They're going through their safety protocols and checks now, but this is for human flight in 2024 around the world. It's definitely worth having a look at their website and seeing what they're up to. But what better then to speak to the President and CEO, Ryan Harmon. Ryan, thanks for joining us. Chris, thanks for having me. Great. And uh, look, like I said, you only need to have a look at the website to start to go, <laughs> all right, I think these guys are onto something and uh, I mean business as well. And you've got an interesting background. You've been in space and sort of aerospace for a long period of time. So you bring some pedigree as well. The main point, I suppose, in terms of the release and us sort of interviewing you is you're going through your sort of safe, you brought together space flight safety experts from NASA, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin to establish your safety program and technical oversight committee. Maybe just talk us through some of the key challenges and there's a lot to unpack here. So wherever you want to start, I pretend, maybe about what's, <laughs> where the world you come from. Uh, and yeah, what's your direction now for 2024 and, and the safety protocols? Well, Chris, you've, you've hit the nail on the head there that, uh, that this is quite the endeavor that, uh, that we have started here and uh, quite the work that uh, is in front of us. But, you know, it really goes back to the beginning of Worldview. Um, and the very first thing we ever did was to take a human to the edge of space. Uh, yep. where we took uh, uh, Alan Eustace to 137,000 feet so he could break the world record for the highest skydive and the longest free fall. But what was important about that is, is us understanding just how challenging it is to take a human into the stratosphere uh, and have them survive. And so that, that's in our DNA. And over the last uh, few years, as we have started to bring our space tourism uh, program to life, we're tapping into that history and recognizing that, you know, you really have to have uh, subject matter expertise and people who truly understand what it takes to do this safely. And, you know, it, it, it all goes back to, for Worldview, uh, our, our vision is for this approach to be the safest and most reliable space tourism operation that, that exists. Uh, and so why not tap into to, yeah. to, 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 to folks who have done that before? Now, take us through for, again, uh, the actual sort of air balloon that's going to take you up. You've got a new capsule. You've got a lot of good information on the website too. In fact, that, that was your website then saying hello to me as well. And we can even uh, <laughs> book flights for $500. That was another key question is, okay, what's the cost on this? <laughs> but um, again... <laughs> The introductory video that you have done, and we'll have some overlays hopefully on, mm. on this session, is you've you've kind of matched this to key points around the world, you know, the Great Barrier Reef here in Australia, uh, Grand Canyon, mm -hmm. for example, where, where you can have a look at the ground and then you can get up and have a look uh, from the stratosphere mm -hmm. and the like. And it was designed to uh, provide time in space rather than just a rocket where you go up and you, you come mm -hmm. back down. So how much sort of... Where did all this thinking start and the design? I mean, how long has this been in, in train for you? And then I suppose the, yeah. sort of the investment side and the business side, how this is going to be functional mm -hmm. by 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it, it, you know, we, we started envisioning this approach when we took Alan to the, uh, to the stratosphere. But really over the last several years, uh, we've really started to design the details. And, you know, you, you pointed out that we're going to be operating in the seven wonders of the world stratospheric edition. That's what we call it anyway. It's the, it's the Grand Canyon, the Great Barrier Reef, the Great Wall of China, Aurora Borealis in northern Norway, the Serengeti in, uh, in eastern Africa, the, the Amazon jungle, uh, and then the, the Great Wall of China. Um, and so each of these places, you know, they're, they're, they're just wonderful places to, to vacation or visit, um, you know, without a trip to the stratosphere yeah. and see it from above. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, the reason we did that, when, when astronauts 
see something that they recognize. They have the, this peak experience. You know, it's often referred to as the overview effect. And so when we started really thinking through the details of our of our space tourism offering, you know, what we uh, what we wanted to do was uh, design it to be more than the flight. Right. It had to be you know, um, something that was connected to uh, someplace unique and majestic on the ground. So, um, uh, so that's where the seven wonders of the world stratospheric edition came from. Um, and then the the capsule itself, you know, um, you know, this this is something we've been envisioning for years. Uh, we did a, a previous version of it that was more of a of a tube design, something more you know akin to an aircraft fuselage, you know. But we really wanted to evolve that design because. The reality is, Chris, is we're in the business of delivering a view, right? yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so we wanted to 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 take the customer perspective uh, into consideration and design uh, a space capsule that optimizes the view. And so, uh, so the capsule has you know magnificent windows, very large windows, three hundred and sixty uh, degree views, um, and uh, and really focused on you know making sure that uh, customers can take it all in. How do you? I suppose there's a number of questions. Maybe let's talk through the key safety protocols for this. And mm -hmm. I suppose one question is, how many flights would you anticipate a day? Like just you know sort of a twelve hour mm -hmm. window of time. Uh, how many would you be doing? And then we'll go through the safety protocols. Yeah. So um, uh, at any of our seven spaceports, uh, we'll be flying roughly 110 days per year. Um, so we call those the flyable days. So those are days where, you know, the, the weather supports uh, a launch and then the, the winds in the stratosphere support a trajectory that enables us to get um, to a, uh, an approved landing location. Uh, and so it's 110 flyable days per year, uh, and then we'll do up to three flights per day um, on those flyable days. Right. Um, that's uh, and that's the plan. So it's a fairly low tempo, but in terms of space tourism, it's uh, yeah. it's a significant number With of flights. Yeah. And the 110 days is that on each site, or is that around the world? Uh, no, the 110 days at each site. Got it. Okay. So you'd be practically flying uh, each somewhere in the world each day, uh, technically, right? Yes, ex exactly. That's okay. exactly correct. And this, and then maybe talk us through the safety protocols. Is those from the from the to the tourist perspective? And I've had a look. Is there's no training? Mm -hmm. There's no spacesuit, which is a bit disappointing. Most tourists would like to stick on a spacesuit <laughs> at some point, but uh, you know. And so there's really it's quite easy. You just get in the capsule, and it does the rest. Uh, yeah, what's the safety protocols on uh, and what tourists would be thinking mm -hmm. about and some of those key aspects? So the, so the capsule is designed where it's a sure sleeve environment. And essentially what that means, uh, Chris, is that it's a pressurized capsule uh, that's temperature controlled. Right. So it would be like you or I getting on uh, an aircraft, a commercial aircraft, and, and uh, no. um, there's no training required, no spacesuit required. It doesn't mean that we won't put people in a snazzy flight suit or something. Give uh, us a T-shirt at uh, least, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, or something. You know, but, but that's what it means. Um, and then f as it relates to safety protocols, I know this is where just the design of the flight itself is very important. Uh, so it all starts with us um, understanding the trajectories of the flight itself. You know, so we've designed the spaceports to, uh, to enable us to fly those 110 days per year, but those 110 days per year are tied to our ability to launch, ascend into the stratosphere uh, to 100,000 feet uh, or more, and stay there for six to eight hours. So over those wow. six to eight hours, we're going to be traveling you know, 60 miles, mm -hmm. 100 miles, um, and then when the flight is over, when we're, we're, we're at the point to return the passengers, the customers back down to the surface of the earth, um, uh, we essentially, um, um, uh, we deploy a parafoil, so a, so a, 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 a wing, and we fly the capsule back down to the surface of the earth. And, and the reason we do that is so that it's a predictable in a very smooth um, return to the surface of the Earth. 
And so these trajectories enable us to fly to these specific locations. Now, you know, the, the safety protocols go much, much deeper than just the design of the flight, of course, Chris. So what we've done here at, at Worldview is we've uh, decided to adopt uh, many of the FAA, um, uh, which would be akin to the CASA regulations around uh, um, uh, just uh, normal aircraft operations, not spaceflight operations, but aircraft operations. So we've uh, designed to, to safety standards uh, that are the same as a, an aircraft carrying eight passengers that weighs, you know, uh, a similar weight as our space capsule. Um, and so, um, so then in addition to that, we're adopting uh, uh, safety standards and regulations um, um, that would be levied against a, a, a commercial aircraft uh, operator, somebody who's flying on a daily basis. Um, this means that uh, before a flight, you know, there's required pre-flight inspections and testing that uh, takes place. It means that the, the, the operators are licensed and certified to fly our, our, uh, our craft. And what has been uh, a, a key priority for us here at Worldview um, is to make sure that we're operating just like an airline would operate, just like yeah. a, you know, a commuter aircraft uh, 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 airline would operate, where it's, you know, a small number of passengers, but the same safety protocols as, you know, taking a significant number of, uh, of passengers aboard an aircraft. Can I ask, have you, have you made submissions to CASA uh, here in Australia already? Are you seeking uh, sort of that clearance and then how maybe the the Great Barrier Reef and the Queensland flights might work? Yep. So uh, so what we started with in Australia is on our remote sensing side of the business. So this is uncrewed um, um, uh, systems. You know, so we use the same technology to fly uh, imagers and, uh, and data collection devices. Um, and so we've started with just the safety case and safety analysis with CASA in Australia on that side of the business. Um, while we work through the FAA side of it in the U.S. to kind of set the foundation of, um, um, of our uh, licensing and our certifications. And then we'll take that package to uh, CASA and work with, uh, with CASA um, on what it's going to take in Australia to, to do this kind of operation. And I think that's a fair point you make because you're already, you've been doing this for some time in your remote sensing. Mm -hmm. So you, you've been working in the stratosphere for a period of time. This is just an add-on in terms of, hey, we could actually take people up uh, for a period of time. So you're You've got, you know, how many flight hours have you already got in this space uh, already, right? Well, well, uh, um, so flight <laughs> hours a lot. Track. I don't know. I, I, we don't we don't track <laughs> flight hours. We track number of flights because the flights that we do with uh, the remote sensing side, you know, the, the, our longest flight is 45 days long. Um, wow, wow. So, <laughs> uh, so there's significant and we have a flight up right now. Uh, you can see maybe behind me here in our flight control, our emission control, you know, we have a flight that's been going for, what, 14 days now. Uh, wow. It'll go for another two to three weeks or so. And so, but we've got, we have 118 flights under our belt. Um, so right. a significant number of flights that leads to a significant number of hours and days of, of experience. Now, you know, so all of that, you know, leads to us being able to understand how to how to operate these systems, but also uh, the uh, it gives us the data to understand how might we change the design when you're taking people, uh, humans yeah. into the stratosphere, um, and that's something that we've uh, we, we've really been studying um, uh, with with lots of intent over the last several years. We've obviously put a lot of thought into it. What would be the ballpark budget that a tourist would need? to have. I noticed for $500 deposit, which is in my ballpark, <laughs> uh, I can book a flight. But yeah, what's the what's the total ballpark yes. that you'd be looking at to make this, you know, a viable business? Because I think that's the other key aspect I like is you, you want to create some volume in numbers in this as well. It's not just taking, you know, 10 people up uh, at, at yes. low numbers. You want, you want volume, right? 
uh, tickets start at fifty thousand um, yeah. dollars, and uh, and they're secured to your point with a five hundred dollar deposit. Now, listen, we know that fifty thousand dollars is still a lot of money, uh, but it's uh, far more attainable than anything else, and uh, and that's our goal is to make this as attainable as possible for people. I think that's a reasonable amount, actually. I would have thought maybe a little bit more. Uh, that take it that's U.S. dollars as well, yes. and. Mm -hmm. The other thing I noticed with the deposits is it's the same around the world. Is that, what, again, another target that you want to keep the consistent price regardless of where you are? That's exactly right, Chris. So, um, it, you know, we, we, we looked at the markets and did a lot of studying of, you know, how do you price this in a way that, uh, that's attainable around the world? And you know, that's where we, we, we settle on $50,000. It's, um, you know, it's something that is attainable globally, um, you know, and, and of, of course people will have to, uh, to save for it and, uh, and some people will finance it, but $50,000, um, you know, is, is an attainable price that, uh, uh, that we're comfortable with. Very good. Well, look, um, given uh, you've got some storms behind you there, Ryan, and so <laughs> lightning's a factor in this particular interview, so there will be some edits, but uh, for the audience, I think I can't recommend more than just to go check out the website. One thing I noticed with this is the bucket list uh, element to this. You know, you can start to tick yes. off these bucket lists <laughs> as well as uh, go to the stratosphere. And for, I think for 50 grand, that's pretty good. Uh, and certainly in the ballpark of of the of the uh, the wealthy enough to to you know we might pay sort of twenty thirty grand for a cruise, first class cruise. Um, I suppose the other thing <laughs> yes. is how many people are you putting in the capsule, and have you built a capsule already? Have you built one? Yep. So uh, eight people um, per uh, per flight uh, plus two crew. Um, and we have built a, uh, a full-sized half capsule. So, you know, just cut the capsule in half. Um, and so uh, just for, for layout and to be able to demonstrate for people uh, just how roomy the capsule is. And then we'll have, you know, the next iteration of a, of a full capsule uh, later this year for testing throughout 2023. Right. And I suppose that is the, the time frame, 2024 for human flight. Would that still be testing or do you think you'll be commercially up and running by 2024? What's your time yep. frame? Yeah, so uh, we'll do our first human-based test flights in uh, the latter half of 2023 and we'll be doing commercial operations in 2024. And uh, and this is again where I try to finish the interview, but I'll keep thinking more questions as well. Is um, the partner <laughs> base, how many partners have you got? Worldview's been around, as you say, for a little while. Do you have key partners in this you know, such as NASA, Virgin Galactic, that are helping you along the way? Yeah, we do. So, so um, um, you know, there's two key components of the space uh, capsule itself. You know, there is the pressure vessel and then the environmental control and life support system. And so we partnered with Paragon Space Development Corporation on the on the ECLIS, the Environmental Control and Life Support System. You know, they've done the life support systems for the International Space Station, uh, for many of the uh, the commercial uh, space capsules that exist today, they've done the life support system for that. Um, and then we've partnered with uh, um, a, a, a company that we'll announce here pretty soon to, to, to help us with the pressure vessel. But um, but a, a you know a a, a group that is specializes in exactly this kind of. Uh, uh, a capsule, and uh, and so we're excited about having industry partnerships that share our vision uh, for a safe and uh, reliable approach to space tourism. Are you looking for partners in Australia as well, and where else? Uh, sort of your, your your launch sites and the like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that we're excited about in Australia is. Uh, partners both for space tourism and the remote sensing side of our business. You know, so taking instruments and imagers to the stratosphere. Um, you know, uh, we're we're really excited about uh, some of the companies that uh, that uh, that exist in Australia making very high end sensors and very high end imagers. And then on the space tourism side. Uh, we'll be looking for manufacturing partners. Um, so, um, you know, some portions of this, the capsule itself and the other critical subsystems uh, we'll bring into Australia and manufacture them in Australia. Okay, very good. Well, as I said, it's uh, worldview.space.
go check it out. And uh, Ryan Hartman there during a uh, an electrical storm uh, in Arizona. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, pleasure. Uh, President and CEO with Worldview. Thank you very much for joining us on Australia and Space TV. Thanks for having me, Chris. Great.